Hello, welcome to Reality TV. I'm Raymond Bakari. Today I'm joined by 2022 Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor Aaron Gukian. Aaron, how are you today? Uh, good morning. Good morning, Raymond. It's good to have you on and uh, good morning to you as well. Um, my first question, it's a, it's a general one. Uh, why do you want to be the state's next Lieutenant Governor? Well, uh, I'm a native son. I'm from East Greenwich. Uh, so I was born and raised here. And uh, I have three daughters. And uh, my wife also grew up here. And when my wife and I kind of discussed this together on, you know, whether I was going to run, you know, the why question came up. And it's because we feel like the state's on the wrong track, um, that things have gotten way too expensive, that uh, we've really, really gone way to the left, and it's really impacting our economy. And because of my qualifications, uh, I have a master's in business administration, and I was a vice president of a bank, I feel that I'm uh, qualified uh, and can be very helpful uh, to the citizens of Rhode Island. And uh, so I felt compelled to jump in. I, I left my position at the Rhode Island Foundation where I was a fundraiser. Um, and I had a, had a great job over there and I left there uh, and I'm all in here. And I put money in to this campaign because I felt obligated to the citizens of Rhode Island for them to have a clear choice in November. And the office itself gets uh, quite a bit of criticism for how many statutory duties it has. Uh, last I checked, there are about 18, which most are appointing and or serving on councils related to small businesses, emergency management, and, uh, and a little bit more. Uh, I would assume since you're running for the office, you, uh, you would want the office to stay and not close down like uh, some have called for in the past. Um, as someone who's running for this office, what would your response be to those who want to close it down? Yeah, so um, I thought about this a lot, and uh, I was a special assistant to Governor Kachiri and the First Lady um, to, from 2003 to 2011. So, you know, I was an eyewitness up there on what the governor was able to do, and then obviously the lieutenant governor. And I felt that the best way to use this office is to take it from a passive sort of, you know, ribbon cuttings and citations and proclamation ceremonies and make it active and take that $1.2 million budget and really help the people. So I, I decided to create a help center. So my platform is to hire people within the community that have background in, in small business, uh, long-term healthcare, emergency management, um, which is under the hood of the Lieutenant governor's office and uh, really help people navigate the system. So, for example, there's a lot of people that come up to me in, in the market or whatever, or what have you, and and they say, Aaron, can you help me with this license issue that I'm having? having? Or, you know, I'm talking to the de Department of Business Regulation. I seem to be getting nowhere, and I don't know really what to do. Um, uh, Department of Human Services, whatever it is. And there's, you know, there's great state workers, but a lot of them, they don't interact with the public, and the person that actually will could expedite that that issue or or bubble it up a lot of time isn't connected to the public so what i thought was we'll have a help center where people are calling in or communicating to our office conveying their issue and then we give them a timeline on how long it will take to resolve that issue we will then get the data um, and then we'll be able to manage up appropriately and convey and advocate on behalf of the citizens of rhode island on the issues and, and it can be as simple as i was talking to a an ice cream uh, store owner, and, and I don't know if this was a city or statewide, but I think you'll get the point is that um, license problem, but they used to have to pay separate licenses or a separate license fee for hard and soft ice cream. And so like, that's the type of thing sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it, it happens in government where certain laws are passed and maybe per people didn't study the statute and saw something else. And what happens in Rhode Island right now is there's so many barriers to entry and it's a username and password or it's it's a queue or whatever it is. And, and what I want to do is is really have people talk to another person, especially our seniors, and uh, and then we'll help navigate the system. And then once we get these frequently asked questions, we'll have a flow chart and we can really maximize the lieutenant governor's office. I think it's I think it's an idea that has never really been thought of. And um, it will really help because there's a lot of taxpayers' dollars at stake here. And it can really maximize the office 
and really help the citizens of Rhode Island. That's what I plan on do uh, when elected uh, lieutenant governor. And uh, how would you go about implementing this uh, help center? Is it just something as simple as people would be able to call the office and say, hey, I have this problem? Well, I think there's probably three um, sort of a three prong plan, we'll say, if you will. One, I, I want to extend the hours. So rather than just 830 to 430, have a couple people at night that are also maybe till 9 p.m. So for those small business owners that are exhausted or those people are working hard, they're able to hopefully talk to a person and or communicate with us uh, via social media, email, um, any sort of communication that we have in the 21st century. Um, and then we'll respond back, right? So, um, and that response, when I was a business banker, a lot of times, you know, things aren't, some things aren't easy, right? So you might, I might say to you, Raymond, okay, after doing my research, it's probably gonna take six weeks. Why don't you put uh, us on the calendar for to have a check-in in two weeks, right? So we both know that we're going to have a call at 11 a.m. on two Fridays from now. Then we do it again, right? And so if we have a uh, phones, we have communication through social media, and, um, and, uh, and and maybe people are just coming up to me or my staff personally, we can then sort of gather the information. People are going to probably have to be a little patient at the beginning, right? Because you might be inundated. But then what I found in, in banking and, and just in my life in general as a teacher or whatever is pretty soon there's a pattern to what the questions are. And if we can get like, say, let's say a top three and keep working through that, I found in my life when you make small changes, you can then get to big change rather than I think some politicians really try to do big stuff right off the bat. And it's just too big and it's too laborious of a process and it, it's, it stalls. But sometimes if you can do those, like that little license example that I told you, um, if you can fix that, that stops the barrier and you can fix other things. And, uh, you know, I think we can really make our state a lot easier to do business in and for people that are sick to get answers um, and get the support they need. Speaking of maximizing the office to its uh, fullest potential, an idea that's been popular amongst uh, one of your Republican candidates and a former Republican candidate for the office is uh, acting as an inspector general, uh, because currently there isn't an inspector general that could do what the Republicans have uh, been fighting for, for, for an office like that to do. And uh, for those watching, an inspector general, if an office were to exist in Rhode Island, would look out for waste, fraud, and inefficiencies in state government and report it. Would that be an idea you would consider implementing as lieutenant governor? Well, I think that's one I would advocate for. Um, and I would manage up and I would um, talk to the governor's office and the speaker and the Senate president. Um, I think that's a, a, a good idea. I think if you look at our statutory, um, you know, if you look at under the statute, what we're supposed to be doing as a lieutenant governor, I really want to kind of focus on the small businesses and the people of Rhode Island, the people that are, let's say, my my uh, mother-in-law passed away from Alzheimer's. And I'm part I'm of the same generation, right? Thank you. Where you have young children, then you have older um, parents that are, and especially in this situation, it was a crisis. And you don't know where to go. And you're just listening, hoping to call somebody and have them connect you with, say, a great state worker from Department of Human Services. Maybe it's, you know, I work with the Rhode Island Foundation or other nonprofits, and I get some stuff on our website, some information, excuse me, on the website. So to try to um, really help the people, I mean, one in four people are going to be 65 in Rhode Island in 2030. And those of, I think it's important not to get scattered all over the place. You can't help everybody. Um, and so I really kind of want to look at the statues, but I would definitely advocate for that. Uh, absolutely. And helping senior citizens out is, uh, is one of the responsibilities the office has. Uh, one of their uh, statutory responsibilities after looking at the list uh, is to serve as or designate a member to go to the long-term uh, care coordinating council meetings. And this is a bit of a controversy right now with the, with the current Lieutenant Governor, because there have been six meetings so far for that council. There were two recent cancellations for that council's meeting. I believe the last meeting was uh, held in, la in late May when I had checked on the, the sos.ri.gov, uh, OpenGov website. Uh, what are your thoughts on the meeting for that council having been recently canceled twice? 
Well, you know, I mean, um, she didn't show up uh, to the debate yesterday on WPRO. You know, accountability is very important, uh, and I take it very seriously. Uh, you know, Woody Allen uh, is famous as saying that, you know, 80% of life is uh, just showing up. Uh, and uh, you have to show up, right? And we have such a crisis right now in long-term health care in our nursing homes. Um, I've talked to a lot of uh, CNAs and, and, and our nurse, nurses. My mom was a respiratory therapist who's retired. And if we don't start getting incentives or incentivizing that workforce to come to Rhode Island and stay in Rhode Island, we're going to be in deep trouble, especially the fact that I just mentioned, you know, the one in four Rhode Islanders. We have an older demographic um, right now. It's, it's pretty close where you could probably get a, a job at, 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 you know, a local gasoline station. Or, or, or a restaurant that pays as much as a CNA. And, and uh, that's no disrespect to anyone in that industry, but uh, CNAs are so critical. Um, they do all the hard work and, and our nurses. And um, from what I'm, I'm hearing is it's, it's, they don't get paid well. Um, the conditions are pretty volatile right now. And, and the people that are running it are doing the best they can. So that's no negative on them as well. It's a crisis. And if it's under, if it's under your responsibilities and you're not even showing up, uh, that that shows me that you know there, there's a problem there. And you know, with my background and with my, um, you know, I'm a relentless person. I'm, uh, you know, as they always say, if you want something done, ask a busy person. And uh, you know, I feel like I'm one of those people. And uh, you know, you got to convene a group of experts. You've got to sit down. You know, healthcare is not my expertise, but, um, you know, coming up with creative solutions, for example, like my brother worked for Teach for America. And after two years, if you stayed and worked as a teacher in those, um, you know, the inner city, um, they would give you $10,000 for graduate school. Um, there might be a way that we can, you know, public private partnership in regards to, you um, you know, paying for licensing fees or whatever it is to make it more attractive, not only to be hired here, but to stay here and try to keep those, uh, you know, some consistency within the workforce for our nursing homes. And, um, you know, that's that's what I will uh, plan on doing when elected uh, lieutenant governor. Would you commit to pushing for that council to meet more often or at least not have two recent back to back cancellations? Yeah, I mean, I commit to, to go to meetings. Um, you know, everyone has situations where you have to cancel. But once it's canceled, you quickly have another meeting. Um, you schedule another meeting. I mean, sometimes there's quorum issues, especially right now. It's the summer, right? Um, but there's really no excuse right now in, the, in this day and age because you have Zoom. You can check in. I'm, a, I'm kind of an old school guy where, you know, I think you can get a lot done over a lunch, coffee. Um, uh, rather than emails and, and, and constant back and forth. You get everyone in the room, like I said, to convene. And, uh, and again, you work on small changes, right? And, and that could just be something simple. But I've noticed that if you can keep doing these small little things, and all of a sudden, a year or two, you're like, wow, we've made some change. And, uh, and also, the workforce and the people in that industry know that you care and you're trying and you're swinging the bat. And I think that's sort of what I'm hearing on the campaign trail is that people like, let's just say they didn't stay, meaning the General Assembly, they didn't suspend the gas tax. They didn't see what New York and Connecticut were doing. They could have done it for six months. We have all sorts of tax revenue because of inflation. Uh, they're sitting on a lot of money, which is different than 10 years ago when we had our last economic problem um, and, and recession because there was no money. Now there's money. Get it out to the public. Help people. Small businesses are also another area of focus the office is responsible, responsible for. I heard from your Republican opponent that he favors eliminating unnecessary regulations and simplifying the ones that are absolutely necessary. Where do you stand on the regulations facing our state's businesses? Well, I think we have to, we first have to do an analysis um and and see like i call it a top 10 right you're probably a little too young for david letterman but he's uh, the david letterman show but you know start a top 10 and what i find is when you're talking and interacting with all the small businesses i plan on having a coffee hour once a month 
at the very least and try to get uh, go all across, the, you know, go to all the 39 cities and towns of the regions and try to hear and listen to what's going on and what's their biggest frustration. It might be one of those license issues or those fees. And, and I found that, you know, most legislators and, and people up there are trying to do the right thing. Uh, that, like I said, there is that component that's just very different from my political philosophy that's very, very to the left. And I disagree with it. And that's why I'm running. But most people are in the middle and they're reasonable and they're pragmatic and they want to do the right thing. And I feel like if you bubble certain things up, they might not be aware. Uh, you know, I was talking to a, an accountant that's having a problem putting a sign on state. They, they committed to a lease and it's a little tricky on whether it's state, city, land or who owns it. And they just want to put up a sign that says, you know, we're open for business. And they, they struggled with that and they don't know where to go. And but that if you don't have a sign, right, people aren't seeing that you're open for business. And that that creates issues in regards to getting, you know, uh, in your supply for 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 work and for for possible, um, um, you know, people that that need your services. So um that's that's what I would do. And, and and again, you know, that's what the help center is all about. And and what's different from the help center from kind of all the other things is this would be organized, it would be structured, and and I have a team of, of experts that are going to manage that data. And it data is everything right now in this world. And once we can we can do that, we can be more efficient with the state. So and also, for example, let's just say there is a certain issue where one person in that particular office, we'll call it the per Department of Business Regulation. Let's just say now all of a sudden they're getting for a lot more work. We can and then can advocate for another full-time employee to back that person up, right? We can say, hey, there's some issues here with some licensing or some fees or whatever the issue is. And this person right now is getting crushed. So let's support that person. And it's not only getting the information and being helpful, but also having a great strategy in the future and then going and talking to try to legislate and working with policy person people and then giving them a you know a firm direction on okay this is what we're seeing this is what we we suggest and uh and then get it into the pipeline and then whatever uh you know the speaker's office or the legislature i should say the governor's office decide at that point we've done as far as we can but there's just so many barriers right now and it's a lot of them are just so unnecessary and they're easy to change that's one component of uh, looking at the uh, topic surrounding small businesses. One that I, it's not necessarily decided by the Office of Lieutenant Governor, but it's a big topic when talking about small businesses is uh, wages, specifically the uh, minimum wage. Uh, our minimum wage, it's going to be uh, $15 by 2025. Some have called for it to go higher than the $15 mark uh, an hour because it won't be enough by then. Uh, should it be raised to higher than $15 an hour? Well, I think right now, uh, if I put on my uh, economist hat, I'm not an economist, but obviously I have an MBA and I've, I've done uh, I've a lot of done a lot of hard work in the classroom. I think we're in open water right now. I think we have to be very careful because um, if you start raising um, the minimum wage too much, then small businesses then have to lay off people, right? Because they can't keep up with it. Um, in theory. When you first hear it, it's like, oh, yeah, raise minimum wage as high as you possibly can. But then if you talk to those mom and pops, it doesn't work financially and for their bottom line. Um, but we are in such a, a different type of uh, economy and no one really knows where things are going. So I would hesitate to, to put a mandate and say, yes, we need to do this. I think what I would do is I would use my qualifications. I would uh, talk to other economists. I talk to other people in the community and say, what do you think makes the best, so what makes the best sense here? Again, getting back to convene, uh, get some, uh, some experts and then advocate. I think that sometimes it's, it's easy politically to just say, oh yeah, do this or do that. Um, and right now, especially, you know, with Twitter and, you know, it's, it's, it's great to just come out and, and say things and people might like it or, or share it, but it's not, um, it's, it's not the right thing to do. I think a lot of times you got to slow things down a little bit and do some research before you just start blanketly saying, oh yeah, raise the rate. I have no idea where we're going to be in six months. I have no idea where we're going to be in a year. 
um, you know, the Fed's raising uh, the interest rate by 75 basis points, <laughs> you know, every quarter almost right now. And it looks like they're going to do it again. And, and that at that point, it might make sense. You just don't know. So I just don't want to be um, uh, just say the wrong thing at this point. Before I get into uh, some non-political topics, I just want to ask one quick education question. <clears throat> so Republicans are on board with the, with an with an, in an expansion of uh, charter schools. Um, governor McKee, when he was lieutenant governor, was on board with it from what it seems. Uh, I don't really know how it is now as governor. Uh, lieutenant Governor Matto seems on board with the with this idea too. When I had her on, she was sound favorable toward the idea. Are you in favor of an expansion of charter schools in the state? Well, let me tell you a couple of things. First, I'm a certified teacher. I taught for a couple of years in, in music, K through 12, in the public schools. Uh, I was on the Blackstone Academy Charter School Board for five years, uh, which was in Pawtucket. Uh, so again, qualifications. I'm not just talking uh, from, from um, without a point of view of a uh, of background. And, uh, and I, will try to diff I will try to highlight that in my campaign. Um, I think with, with charter schools, uh, yes, I'm for choice. Um, I also know that uh, there's a lot of uh, hardworking teachers and that they're doing the right thing. I'm a public school um, graduate. Uh, and I think that what's happening and what I'm listening to is, is there's, I think we're starting to just kind of go off the, I think right now, especially after COVID, and I have three daughters, you know, one that just graduated high school, one in middle school and one in elementary. It's actually just elevating to middle school this year, sixth grade. But I guess the point is, is that I live it. I think it's important that we get back to the basics of, uh, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. I think that there's, on the teacher's side, I think there's a lot of documenting that they have to do, um, especially in special ed, which I think is preventing them from teaching. So I think that I mean, a majority of our students are going to be going to public school. And and I think it's, you know, I, I love what charter schools are doing. I think that some of those, some of the things that are being, are successful in charters could, could be conveyed to the public school and vice versa. Um, but I think as a whole, especially in Providence, which is just a, a absolute failure right now. And uh, we really need to get back to the basics and if a kid or a student, you know, I think it's by third or fourth grade, grade, you know, if they haven't, if they can't get the basic skills, it's 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 very difficult to come back from it. So we really need to to emphasize reading, writing, and math. And then finally, you know, I've I've done some um, visits. I think we need to get the career tech back into technical, uh, like shop and and home ec back into the high schools. Um, we have a lot of machinists. That's another supply chain that's really problematic. My father and my uncle Pat were local 51 plumbers uh, and steam fitters union. We need to start teaching kids, you know, in junior high and middle school and high school, the basics uh, and also about blueprints. So uh, I know we have Davies and we have the Providence. Uh, it's like PCTA. I forget what I call it. Alphabet soup. We have the technical schools. We really need to get it back into, let's say, Charahoe and, and, and East Greenwich, whatever it is, because some students are almost being shamed, but but they really shouldn't be. They should be pushed up. So I think we really need an advocate um, with background that really understands education. It's one of the lanes I feel comfortable with. I, 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 I studied that at Connecticut College, which was my undergrad. And uh, we have to, again, get a lot of experts in the room and try to make things easier for the teachers so they can teach. Um, and uh, so that's sort of my point. Looking at some quick non-political topics, you're an opera singer, uh, being an artist in residence at the National Op Opera Company in North Carolina. This was on full display when you did an amazing job singing the national anthem at the recent Rhode Island GOP convention uh, because the person that they had was uh, stuck in traffic. Um, I just got to ask, how'd you get into opera singing? Well, I, my parents weren't musical. You know, my mom could sing a little bit. Um, I started, I just came home in fourth grade and started picking up the trumpet. You know, I played the trumpet and then my freshman year, um, some, some, uh, Friends of mine who were girls uh, came up to me and said, we need uh, some boys in the choir. 
and I was a big athlete and I said, yeah, I'll stop by. And, and I started singing and, uh, and that kind of East Greenwich has a great music program. And, uh, I found out I had a gift. Um, and so then from there, I went to Connecticut college and, and majored in music and, 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 uh, and then I went to the Eastman school, which is, uh, up in Rochester, uh, you know, the founder, George Eastman, George Eastman of Kodak was a philanthropist who, who, who funded that. And, uh, most people know Juilliard. If Juilliard was the Harvard, you know, Eastman's the Yale of uh, of conservatories in the United States. And and uh, I went to graduate school for opera. So it uh, it wasn't something like uh, this was my dream from the beginning or my parents' dream. It just sort of uh, organically happened. And and I have a gift. And uh, I just sang last night to uh, to honor uh, a person who passed away a couple of years ago. Sorry. Um, speaking of your time, at, uh, Conne- <clears throat> excuse me. Speaking of your time at Connecticut College, you also played basketball there too. From what I was able to find out, you had some good stats uh, and are on the all-time scores list for the team uh, called the Camels uh, with, I believe, uh, one thousand one hundred sixty-eight points. I gotta ask, what was your time like as a college basketball player? Yeah, well, you know, I, I was. We had a. I was uh, the coach's first recruit, and we we're we're. And this actually was great for life you know we were four and 20 my freshman year I was the rookie of the year in the ECAC in New England and, and I had a you know kind of a, a great season but we had a, a, a bad team and ultimately you know my stats went down right because you have better teammates and so you learn how you know what to do in, in bad conditions to make them and I was very proud that we won uh, the NESCAC, which is really the Williams the Colby's kind of the ACC of uh, division three and we went to the sweet 16 uh, that year in the NCAA tournament. So it was a big turnaround. And, uh, and again, it's, it's attention to detail. It's accountability. It's small details that those small changes that get the big changes. And, and I've seen it in the arts. I've seen it in sports and, and something that I want to replicate. And I also saw it in the governor's office with, with governor Kachiri. Um, so it's something that I want to bring to the Lieutenant governor's office, but yeah, I, I had a quite a career at uh, Connecticut college and I'm proud of it. A lot of hard work, determination, and um, and it just kind of another example of what, you know, hopefully shows the voter that, um, you know, I'm a, a determined individual and I take things seriously. Speaking of uh, good teammates you had, I, I was going down this rabbit hole when I was looking up some of the for non-political topics. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Nardwar. He does these kind of like in-depth questions based on background. So I'm just going to say a name. And if I have the story true, uh, supposedly how this person got on the team involves you. Um, how did Zach Smith get on that team? Oh, yeah, Zach. Well, Zach ended as an All-American. So the, the next year, they went to the Final Four, and they were undefeated. They lost in the Final Four. But uh, all those guys that I played with, I was so proud of them. So uh, Zach was uh, just kind of playing. It was He wasn't recruited. He was a, a PG guy and just a great athlete. And I saw him just shooting around. And I could see that this he was 6'6". He was, he was rangy. He could shoot it. He could dunk it. I said, you know are you on a recruiting trip? He goes, no, I'm just with my friend. He goes, I'm getting kind of recruited. So I ran to the coach's office and I said, you got to come see him. And, um, and, and, you know, some people would say, oh, that guy's a threat because he he was my position, but uh, I'm, I'm always like get as many of the best athletes on the team so we can win. And so ultimately, uh, you know, we, we were great friends. I was just texting him last night and, uh, and uh, it's those, those um, because we, we, we experienced so much, you know, we have such great relationship and, uh, you know, I was just uh, so happy for him uh, that he was able to get into Connecticut College and and uh, he kind of came out of nowhere. And again, he was an All-American. Yeah, I was looking at that story and it was in a, from what I was able to read, it was in a New York Times article from the late 90s. It was a 1995 yeah. pickup game that he was playing with uh, someone on the team. And you just, like you said, you saw him playing and just mentioned to the coach, hey, we should we should get him on the team. I thought that was an interesting story. So I wanted to take a take, yeah, take, cool. take a take and a quick that's uh, how I, I am in life it's like um you know just all you know it also speaks to emergency management which is also under the hood of lieutenant governor's offices you know with the help center right we'll, we'll be doing what i just articulated but when an emergency occurs we'll have all hands on deck right we'll help the the governor who was obviously um uh, you know, we'll be in charge in those in the adjutant general and the colonel of state police, the head of state. 
uh, with the governor. And uh, with my experience, again, you know, you can't teach or rush experience. You know, it was six weeks into it, Governor Kachiri's office. I was, um, we were, we were, we had the station fire, right? My mom was a respiratory therapist at, at Kent Hospital when it occurred. And, and uh, you know, you go through that. I was uh, also the chairman of the Work Sewer Authority Board. I think I was just a board member at the time when we had the flood of 2010. But, you know, you interact with all the agencies, you see what works, you see what doesn't work. And, um, and it's, and I hate to have a sports analogy, but it's the same thing. Like you want to get the best people around you. You know, I'm not intimidated with having people who are smarter than me or, 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 uh, you know, have more talent than me even, uh, cause I just want the state to thrive. And, um, especially in emergencies, you know, you really need all that, all hands on deck and, especially if you're on a losing streak in college basketball, uh, you really have to stop criticizing each other and saying, all right, let's get together, let's pull it together and let's move forward. And, uh, and that's another thing I learned through sports. I just have one final question. It's a non-political topic. Uh, I like to ask everyone this at the end to keep the tradition. In your opinion, what do you think Rhode Island is best known for? Well, we're the ocean state. And um, um, I know Ashley Kalis is really touting, who's running for governor. Um, the blue economy. And I think that they'll, especially now with innovation um, and, you know, and I really hope we can get an innovation center. I know they do a lot URI um, with oceanography, but there's just a lot of creative ways that we can use the ocean, which is right there um, to hopefully kind of generate our economy. Uh, Governor Kachiri, he was really the leader leading uh, force in regards to wind. Um, so we can use that. Um, I, I, you know, I was told that you can get seaweed and, and there's a new way of getting that and creating fertilizer. Um, you know, I'm not that familiar with it. So I tentatively talk about it a little bit, but just kind of innovation centers and trying to maximize our strengths is it's what's so important. And I think that's what we need to do. That's what I will do as Lieutenant governor is try to be, okay, what's in our backyard, right? <laughs> you know, we, what are we doing well? And, uh, and what, what are the resources we have? We have the port, right? There's so many different things. We have, we have access to 95. Uh, we're right in the corridor from New York and Boston. And so that's the way we're going to get the state back on track is hopefully these newer industries start uh, bring, hopefully getting you know businesses here to support those industries, which hire people, which they spend their money in the economy and things get better. So, um, so I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I wanted to thank you, Ray, uh, for for scheduling this. And and uh, you know, uh, obviously I'm a Rick graduate. You know, after the Eastman School and touring, I went back and got my master's there. So, um, you know, I'm, I'd love to be you know active and, and helpful to any Rick graduates. Thank you, thank you for coming on the show and giving me your time. And I'm glad to hear that you that you came from Rick. Rick produces a, a lot of a lot of uh, great people that are uh, leading leading our state right now, actually. And uh, you know, whether it's the local and uh, state level, they're all all over. Uh, you got uh, yeah. Mayor cool. Fong, Congressman Langevin, uh, even yeah. outside yeah. of politics, Viola Davis. Um, yeah, uh, thank. Uh, it's a uh, great to have you on, and uh, you're always welcome back on in the future. As I as I say with every candidate, I really enjoyed this conversation. And um, yeah, thank you. Oh, primary, you know, after the primary, you know, I'd love to come back and I'd love to meet you personally. And, and uh, you know, I, I really think it's great that you are doing what you, you should be commended, that uh, you're not only, um, you know, it seems interested in politics, but you're also spreading the word and, and getting the, you know, getting the information out there so so voters can make a, an intelligent decision come September 13th in my primary. So vote for Aaron Gukan and then November 8th in, in the general. So uh, Godspeed, my man. Thank you. That means a lot. And thank you for watching this episode of Reality TV. If you want to see future episodes as soon as they're posted on this channel, please click the subscribe button down below and the post notification bell icon to the right of it. I'm Raymond Bakari, and I'll see you on the next episode.